good morning, church. I'm Pastor Leslie, and all of us here at Simpson United Methodist Church in Pullman, Washington, are so happy that you have chose to worship with us this morning. I hope um, for those of you that are interested that you have had a chance to look through our church's plan for a safe re-entry, um, which was posted upon our website um, a week or so ago. And if not, I invite you to do so. It is, like I said, it's available on our church website. Um, I invite you to take a look at it and then to provide um, any feedback that you might have. Uh, the committee did an outstanding job, actually. They did an outstanding job of thinking through all of the difficult areas and tasks that were being required of us to keep our congregants and our community safe. So we would love to hear your thoughts and comments. Um, this Tuesday, August 25th at 6.30 p.m., again on Zoom, we will be having a time of friendship and fellowship. And we invite you, this is kind of new and kind of cool, we invite you to bring your favorite bottle of wine and uh, some cheese and join us for our first ever wine and cheese pairing on Zoom. Um, the invite should be in your Simpson Weekly or in this morning's email. So um, we hope to see you there. Should be a really, really fun evening. We've had some great times of friendship and fellowship this summer. So if you haven't joined us yet, I hope you will this Tuesday. Let us now uh, take a moment and prepare to enter into um, a time of worship. Would you join me um, in our call to worship? You are our security, O oh Lord, and we find refuge in you. Everything that is good comes from you, Lord. You give me guidance and make my heart glad. You lead me on the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your kingdom, there is fulfillment forever. Amen. Well, let us worship the God who has called us here together with our opening song. Jason is going to be introducing us to a new song titled Beautiful Things, and it'll be immediately followed by our psalm reading for today from Psalm 16. Beautiful things, you make beautiful things. 
comes out of the dust You make beautiful things You make beautiful things out of us You make beautiful things You make beautiful things out of the dust You make beautiful things You make beautiful things out of us You make me new, you are making me new. You make me new, you are making me new. You make beautiful things, you make beautiful things out of the dust You make beautiful things You make beautiful things out of Protect me, God, because I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have nothing good. Now as for the holy ones in the land, the magnificent ones that I was so happy about, let their suffering increase because they hurried after a different God. I won't participate in their blood offerings. I won't let their names cross my lips. You, Lord, are my portion, my cup. You control my destiny. The property lines have fallen beautifully for me. Yes, I have a lovely home. I will bless the Lord who advises me, even at night. I am instructed in the depths of my mind. I always put the Lord in front of me. I will not stumble, because he is on my right side. That's why my heart celebrates and my mood is joyous. Yes, my whole body will rest in safety, because you won't abandon my life to the grave. You won't let your faithful followers see the pit. You teach me the way of life. In your presence is total celebration. Beautiful things are always in your right hand. Hey, kids! I just wanted to let you know that there is a specific kids message for this week. However, it's in a standalone video on YouTube. So make certain that you can find the kids message on our Simpson United Methodist Church YouTube page for Psalm 16. Okay, we'll see you there. Church, would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Well, folks, this psalm, Psalm 16, is one of trust in uncertain times. Um, trust in uncertain times. Sound familiar? I cannot even begin to count how many people I have talked to, including ministers in ministry with me, 
that um, who are questioning or asking, could this be the beginning of the end? Could this be the end of the world as we know it? Folks, if nothing more, we are most certainly living in uncertain times. Even in the opening verse of this psalm, the psalmist asks for God's protection and refuge. The pleas here are not nearly as urgent as they are a lament. Oftentimes, um, this psalm is paired with Mark 13, 1 through 8. which reads, As Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will we see these things happen? What sign will show that all these things are about to come to an end? Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name, saying, I'm the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must happen, but it isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. Reminds us when Jesus came out of that temple and said, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. This text, this Psalm today fits really well with this Mark text where the world seems to be falling apart and that there is fear in the air. I have a friend, a female pastor friend, who plays a game with her husband and her kids um, with their local, with their local or national news. So what they do is they all watch together, you know, like the evening news, I'm guessing, um, and each has to list all of the things in that newscast that tell them to be afraid during that 30 minute span of news. I mean, I've tried it. Their average is like six to eight per broadcast, ranging from um, be fearful of persons of different races, be fearful to scary multinational terrorist groups, or even something as simple as be fearful of the dangers of sunscreen. I mean, um, crazy the amount of things we are told to fear in our news. In fact, it is her way of showing her children um, just how much of the media is designed to keep them fearful. It's an inoculation of sorts um, because clearly fear sells. It does. Fear sells. So the authors of both this Mark text and this psalm knew that. And both texts serve as an antidote to us, to a culture selling fear. Both apocalyptic in nature, yeah. But the theme of both of these texts is to trust in the Lord 
and to ignore those who say otherwise. It means to trust God in the face of uncertainty, in the face of an uncertain future. Um, the psalm is written in five stanzas of two verses each. And as you all know, a psalm is also a song. Um, they sang, uh, the writers would sing these psalms. They served as poems, um, hymns, but psalms are songs. And the five stanzas of these, each, each two verses each, make it very symmetric in nature. Um, the first and the last stanzas are um, both statements of trust, trust, um, and trust in God, uh, providing a circular movement, kind of like um, what we talked about last week with Psalm 133. Um, the Psalm begins with an imperative plea to God, protect me God, because I take refuge in you. Truth be told, at the end of the day, nothing can protect us from danger. The uncertainty of things is difficult and produces anxiety. It, it does. I mean, but this psalm is to remind us that no matter what is happening or where things seem to be headed, you know, uh, we can find and take refuge in God. The stanza then quickly moves um, further, declaring not only God's protection, but it says, apart from you, I have nothing good. Friends, it's more than safety. It's happiness. And this kind of Joy or happiness is only found in God or in the gifts that God provides. Most Psalms provide some type of contrast within them, and a lot of folks find those really distracting. Um, but it is simply the shape of ancient poetry. And so the second stanza, which is verses three and four, is just that. It contrasts the holy ones in the land, the Israelites, with those who choose another God. And the psalmists promise not to follow the latter. Um, in verses five and six, or in the next stanza, it returns to the good that God gives. The person who has the characteristics in this psalm is complete. And because they are complete, they are happy and content. God has provided boundaries or property lines that are praised. Boundaries. And we all need boundaries. <laughs> God's gifts of a portion and of, an, of the inheritance of a lovely home are enough. They're enough for the one who is praying this prayer, singing this psalm, and are worthy of praise, worthy of praising the God who supplied for their needs. We too are to be content in God and the parameters that are placed upon us and, our, and the parameters of our human existence. We too are to be complete. And this contentment is not about material or monetary value. And it does not imply that um, the broken systems of this world are justified 
or that one should just be content in the face of racism, sexism, employment disparity or discrimination and injustice. No, no, that's not what this means. This psalm is not speaking in defense of injustice or broken systems. But we, you and I, should be content with God and our relationship with God and our place in God's kingdom with one another. It is this type of personal completeness that provides the strength and confidence to speak out against worldly powers, to speak out against injustice, racism, sexism, employment disparities and discrimination. In fact, God has given to us what we need and even our conscience is a gift for it keeps us in the ways of the Lord. The next stanza, which is verses seven and eight, actually continue the confession, declaring the greatness of the Lord for teaching, for God's teaching and God's constant presence. This psalm, Psalm 16, blesses God for the gift of God's counsel and a conscience that is guided by God, keeping us from taking the wrong paths in life. Finally, this psalm ends with resounding praise of what is to come in the future and that that future is secure in God's hands. Here we see again how both the Mark text and today's psalm reading kind of mesh together into a really powerful message. Sadly, the good news of God often comes twisted into a rapture theology that teaches humans to get right with God or to face eternal wrath. The end of times, sometimes understood from the Gospels, are yet another thing that we are to fear. Both of these texts state that the future, our future, is in God's hands. And that fear does not rule us. That we are not driven or consumed by fear and anxiety because we can trust in the one who holds us within their hands. The second coming is not the terrible end to our world, but in fact, it's the glorious transformation of old broken systems into justice for all, for all whom the Lord made. I hope you heard that for all whom the Lord made. In your presence is total celebration. Beautiful things are always in your right hand. Friends, the kingdoms of this world are violent and unjust places. So our trust, our trust should be placed in God's right hand where our complete selves are to be found, our contentment, our completeness. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup says the psalmist, and as followers of Jesus, 
we must choose him again and again and again. This psalm is a song of confidence and trust in the one who does not abandon us to death. No. Some might even say it is a love song. (laughs) Sung not because the psalmist led a perfect existence, but because God had been faithful even in the worst of times, in times of uncertainty. God is faithful, even in the midst of a pandemic, when we see no clear end in sight. God is faithful. It is God who has been and will remain steadfast and faithful. As the psalmist sings, you teach me the way of life. In your presence is total celebration, or in other uh, translations is fullness of joy. Beautiful things are always in your right hand. Amen. Folks, I invite you to join us as we sing together, I am thine, O Lord. come together and pray for one another and the needs of our world. Oh God, hear our cries for those who are, who hunger and those who are full. For those who need you desperately, and for those who have no need for you at all. For those who wrestle with the impact of being your blessed children, and for those who are unaware of your offered blessings. God, we bring to you 
concerns that are too difficult to express. Hear our cries, O oh God, of our salvation. We live to you praying for our family and friends. Our community in which we live for our nation, our world, and all of its leaders. God, we live to you, all who have suffered loss, no matter what that looks like, whether loss of job, income, security, housing, food, Whatever it is, God, we bring them to you. God, we lift up all who are in need of your care and your comfort. We continue to pray for Anne Williams. God, may she be surrounded by your vast chorus of witnesses that she would feel your peace as she awaits to hear on tests. And God, continue to hold her in your right hand. We live to you um, Dave and Anne's daughter, Jessie. We just ask God that she have a um, an issue-free birth, bringing little Tinkerbell into the world. Whether or not that's already happened by the time we view this, it could have already happened. And so God, we just pray for mom or baby Tinkerbell as well as for dad and we lift them to you God God we lift to you all the injustices that are done and carried out in your name God we now offer up to you our own concerns and needs on our hearts. Holy One, may we pray for and carry the voices of all those who have been silenced or muted. And Creator God, we pray for all of your creation and design. This home that you have provided for us with all good things. Yet, we have not done as we should. These things that nourish and sustain us. We have, um, we have not cared for and tended to our home. We have allowed for dangerous toxins to enter our water and food sources and supplies. Good and loving God, help us to do better. Help us to change this course and to do our part, each one of us in recreating alongside of you a place where we can all thrive just as you intended. All of these prayers, we lift to you, O oh God, 
trusting in your care, love, and mercy. Amen. Friends, this week's offertory quote is from Tao Te Ching. And Tao Te Ching says, The heart that gives gathers. Now friends, here are some ways that you can give of your tithes, gifts, and offerings. Friends, let us pray. God of creation, you are good and generous, abounding in love and mercy. We pray that you will use these gifts that we bring for the good work of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Now, friends, receive this benediction. As you go from here, remember God is always with you. No matter what you face, no matter what trials or hardships come your way, God is right beside you, guiding and directing your path. So do not live in fear, but enjoy celebrating God's presence and singing God's praise. Go in peace, friends. Join us in singing our closing song, You Are My All in All. My strength when I am weak, you are the treasure that I seek, you are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, or to give up I'd be a fool, you are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God. Sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all.